I am to have Amy Miller here today. Um, Amy Miller uh, is the author of Last Life Lessons, which is a, a workbook uh, that she'll tell us a little bit about. She's also uh, one of the co-authors of Aging in Place Conversations um, that we've uh, featured on here before. But I'm really excited uh, about some of the ideas and processes that Amy is going to share with us today. And so without further ado, let's welcome Amy to the stage and uh, kick this off. Uh, Amy, great, great seeing you from the uh, the great state of Minnesota, I understand. Yeah, it's a gorgeous spring day here. So loving it. So thanks so much for inviting me back. Oh, you bet. And um, so, Amy, you know, what I like to do before we dive into these topics is just let our audience get to know you a little bit better. Tell us a little bit about your background and what led to what you're doing now. Absolutely. Well, I am coming from kind of outside of the uh, industry. So I'm coming in from that perspective. Uh, so I'm in uh, just outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I was working in corporate America for about 22 years and transitioned actually to become a mediator. So I, I was skilled as a mediator. I was doing that for my corporate job and then said, okay, I'm going to go into that industry. Well, it was in February of 2019. Uh, we had a really cold week. It was, I think, 25 below zero here in Minnesota. And we had like a little mini shutdown. Well, I had a little brain freeze and I ended up going to the wrong meeting. Uh, and it was at that meeting, I ran into healthcare providers who shared that they were seeing two problems within their, their experience. One of them was healthcare directives. Uh, if you don't have a healthcare directive and you go to the emergency room, they don't know what your wishes are, so they have to follow their protocols. And then the second is people are going to the uh, doctor appointments alone. So again, as you can imagine, that can be a very challenging conversation for everybody. Did I have any ideas, suggestions, know anybody who could help solve this? And as I was kind of looking around on the landscape, at least here in Minnesota, maybe it's elsewhere, it's they have it all figured out. What would that solution be? And that's when I realized it, it was an open opportunity to start looking at what is aging like in America. Uh, and in the process, I also learned what it is like with uh, what I call the forgotten middle. So a lot of support is geared towards the, you know, those who have a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of a lot of resources, they can go hire the resources out. Those who have no resources, we have the government programs. But I would say about half the senior population, it's the middle, and they're basically told spend down your money so you can qualify to be in the bottom. And it's like, that's not a good solution. <laughs> Man, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, yeah. and and I would even sort of say that that, that group, um, depending on where you live in the country too, is, is that somebody who might be considered in the affluent or top wealthy uh, in, in an urban area, it's, you could feel like you're really caught between the cracks there in that forgotten middle section. Um, Correct. So, um, okay, well, this is great. I, I love hearing the stories of how people sort of found their way to this segment. And, um, and, and I feel like the outside perspective of being a mediator is a great entryway and probably helped you develop the uh, skill set that has enabled you to be successful in this in this area. Well, so you know, as you can see, folks on the bookshelf right behind Amy, she's she's uh, written and co-authored a couple of books. Um, and my general way of thinking, I love having authors on these discussions because they've researched topics with great detail. It's their objective, you know, and they can share those stories. But I had a little chat with Amy before we started and she said, Steve, I got a couple of really um, outside of the box ideas or I forgot how you framed it. And I was like, you know what? 
we'll talk about the book at some point. Let's jump in with kind of what's on your mind and what you'd like to share to help our audience and the people that they know. Absolutely. So I call them audacious ideas. Uh, oh, I'm even better. <laughs> audacious ideas. This is this is getting better by the minute. Oh, only because I get a lot of pushback. We can't do that. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, I think we could. Uh, so I'm just going to set that bar. We're going for audacious here today. I love uh, it. And, it. and it has to do with the two big topics, especially when I've been listening to podcasts that you've been hosting. They're on housing and health care. And the costs, and because that right there, those two costs alone will bankrupt uh, anyone in the middle faster than you can blink an eye at. And then I'm also specifically talking to uh, the adult children. That's where I've found there's a lot of work being done for the seniors, for those who are already retired, but there's not much being done to actually speak to the adult children until it's too late. And then all of a sudden, your options are very limited. And it's interesting because when I've talked to people about my my concept, my ideas, my model, it sort of fits into the uh, the case manager role. So that's what I mean about documenting. So the documentation, again, writing down your wishes before they're needed is really critical. The thing is it never happens soon enough. So my goal is I've kind of like gone after like the, the meat and the potatoes of this whole aging process where I'm not seeing anybody putting very much attention to. They do it after, but not before, not early. And so I'm, that's why I'm saying I'm really going with audacious ideas because I'm trying to activate, if I can use the term, a mama bear, um, because they're the ones who are going to say, oh, this is coming down the road. What do I need to know to care for my aging parents? I'm still caring for teenagers at home or raising families or working full time. You know, that whole space, this is not a topic that's on their radar. So how do we start that conversation? And so that's kind of where I'm coming in. Well, let's go with Audacious and see where it takes us. All right. So let's let's dive into this first sort of audacious uh let's break it down a little bit and sure can you can you describe it to us and then folks if you got any questions you just jump in uh, yeah please this is what i like i i love it when the, uh folks present something that might seem un, unachievable um because it's a a great way to sort of have a good dialogue and move towards what might be more achievable. So, uh, so this is great. All right, Amy, let's, I'm intrigued. So the, the first one is it's around healthcare and people do not realize that family members can be paid by family members for their care. So, uh, and this idea kind of stems off of what Medicare offers. If you have a family member, they live with you, Medicare will pay your family member to have you there 24 seven. So oftentimes this is for those family members who uh, have to take a leave of absence. They have to quit to care for their loved ones uh, because they need you know, that high level of care. What I'm proposing, and I have what's called a caregiving agreement, which is a bit of a modification of a home health program, but it's also something that is allowed legally by every state on how much family members could pay their loved ones directly for their care. But in truth, I'm kind of putting it all actually back onto the, the seniors, the parents, the, the person needing the care to decide how much they can pay. So instead of doing industry rates, you know, if you have, let's say $10, you can pay someone to go do your grocery shopping. You have an agreement with someone to go grocery shopping for you and you pay them the $10. The nice thing about this is there's a document that then supports why do you have a deduction coming out of your bank account for $10? So then it's not seen as a gift. It's or, seen as or worse, yeah, fraud against a family member, because as we know, that is this segment is that's why a lot of money is flowing out of checking accounts into family members checking accounts is fraud it can be fraud or it could be very legitimate it could be because right. they are going to the grocery store and 
so many adult children going, no, I can't take that money. I can't do that. And I'm thinking, okay, let's think this down the road a little bit, because these are stories that I hear is the adult child who was the primary caregiver for their parents. And I'm just using this typical story. Um, the, the parents last years, maybe they live with mom and dad rent free, which the other brothers and sisters go, oh, how unfair. Um, and then they, they're they supposed to inherit the house. Well, what happens if mom and dad did a reverse mortgage so they could pay their medical bills? And so therefore, when mom and dad pass away, there is no, unless the other family members could pay for the house, there is no house to pass on to that child who is doing all the caregiving. Meanwhile, the other family members get whatever's in the will or the trust. And I've seen that happen where that adult child gets nothing and they've done all the work. And there's something that's disconnected about that conversation. But if it's intentional, it's created ahead of time. And this is the trick. It's also what I call an aging concierge is someone is overseeing this process. It's not to be like, it's kind of like being your private social worker, I guess mm -hmm. you could call it that. Um, but someone just to keep track to make sure that people are getting the care. They're not being, um, you know, ex uh, financially exploited. They're, uh, you know, being active and engaged and getting good care and the communications happening between family members. There's a care uh, report. So people have that that three full binder that's saying, okay, yep, mom, we did this for mom. Uh, medications, mom took her medications at this time. You know, we had the neighborhood. Um, I love this story. This, this one um, man arranged to have a kid come from the neighborhood. They had a Boy Scout come knock on the door and sell a wreath. And he arranged to have that Boy Scout come every week to go walk his dad so he could get a break. And meanwhile, his dad, who has Alzheimer's, thought he was talking to an old army buddy because he showed up in his uniform every week. So, I mean, it's creating a different solution to this whole health care challenge, whether or not it's paid volunteer. That would be something that has to be decided ahead of time. Um, but it's something I think that could be implemented by anybody. Uh, now, the those who are solos, which is another passion topic of mine. So those who are aging alone, turns out, according to the 2020 census, I'm sure this is shared off on, on your call, but according to the 2020 census, 20% of people over the age of 55 are not married and do not have children. So that is a growing segment in our aging community and do we have a solution on how to provide for them yep. i see this as being a long-term solution where instead of saying family as in you know your immediate family for solos family is who you choose them to be mm -hmm. yep and and even for uh, uh, even for people with big families it's like the stories of there's no way I want any of my kids being my financial power of attorney for whatever reason. My best friend knows what to do and I trust her, you know, but um, so a couple of questions. Um, uh, Adele asks, explain how Medicare will pay for a family member to take care of a, uh, of, of, of an older parent. I did, did you, did you? Yeah, it's, it's, to be honest with you, I'm concentrating on that forgotten middle part more so than what Medicare offers, but it's something that, and this is so I'm going to pass again, I'm not in the industry. I'm looking at this from the outside. Um, I'm going to pass that question on to the people who know the answer. Uh, so if there's someone on this call who might have a good connection. Well, and actually uh, Adele, um, let me share my screen real quick because our discussion on Friday is about this self-directed care program and I believe this this program. I, I think it, there's it's in Virginia, and if you apply and qualify for this program, there that it can uh, pay to have a loved one uh, through Medicare. Uh, but we'll learn more about that on Friday. I'm I'm not a hundred percent expert on this topic. That is one uh, program, and I will uh, drop that in to uh, to chat there. 
Um, and and Lisa says Medicare does not pay for a companion. Um, okay. Uh, and Lisa would know because she's in the insurance business. But but what I like the concept that you're bringing up here on pay, and it doesn't need to be pay, but is okay. Um, I'm in the caught between the cracks, forgotten middle group. I have money in my checkbook, and um, I'm going to call up Shady Acres Home Care and pay them to be my companion for three days a week. But for the other two days a week or other four days a week, if my adult child or my grandchild or my my son-in-law was was doing something similar, I should I would like to compensate them. And it doesn't need to be at the same rate and they don't need to accept it. But if I'm in charge of my care agreement, maybe I can budget for that. So this is sort of outside the realm of Medicare and Medicaid, correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is totally outside. It's private pay. Um, so for example, you need help paying your bills. You might have to pay a CPA $150 an hour to pay your bills, or maybe you can make an arrangement. You pay $50 a month to your son, son-in-law to do that. And, and it's not that they have access to your money, but they just make sure your bills get paid every month. And you, so it's whatever you can afford. And the idea is that these are for the people who do have some of their own finances and they're not trying to spend down their income to qualify, but it's a way that they can pass on, you know, their legacy while they're still alive. One, two is that people forget that they can gift up to $16,000 a year each person. So it is a way to, if you don't want to, you know, hire them as, let's say, a 1099 employee, you can hire, you can provide a gift to that family member. It's legitimate and legal. Now, the one downside of that is if you're qualifying or trying to qualify for Medicare assistance or in my state, um, Minnesota's a little bit got their own program. It's called the elderly waiver. You have a five-year look back on your finances. And so if they see you gifting money you will not qualify for elderly waivers. So those are some of the questions to kind of think of is could I, where am I at in that spectrum? Am I looking towards qualifying for Medicare or elderly waiver? Or do I have the finances? I just want to, you know, it's part of my financial plan. So again, and this stuff is not done just because you decide to do it. I highly recommend you're partnering with your attorneys and your financial planners and insurance agents to see if what is a way to make this work. So you could be using their tools and their um, programs to like, you know, maybe it's funding out of your annuity or maybe you do a life insurance. You create a, you open up a life insurance policy for your family member and that's how you you personally fund that life insurance policy. So then they receive that, you know, upon death. There's so many different ways that you can do this. But again, these things need to be think, thought about and put in place ahead of time. And you brought up a, uh, a, a, a the topic of paying bills, which especially if somebody's transitioning from a healthcare incident, from the hospital back home, and or if they're developing macular degeneration, Paying bills is challenging in an outside profession. That's awesome. I'm dropping it into a chat is the Association of Daily Money Managers. And um, I also put Christine Dolan, one of our positive aging champions, who's a uh, daily money manager. So if that sort of rang a bell in this discussion, um, check out the daily money managers. But the daily money managers, again, that can be a, a loved one that you already trust and know. And you have spelled out that if I have difficulty managing and paying my bills, you know, my son-in-law, who's the CPA, I'd like him to do that, you know. Um, so this this sounds this sounds great. And and so the the care you call it the family caregiver agreement. It's a yeah, it's family caregiving agreement, caregiving agreement. I actually have it on my website. Um, I think right now it's still open for open download, uh, which is under the resources page if you happen to. Yeah, let me pull this up. Okay. 
this is where I like going, okay, what's not working on my website today? <laughs> we'll find out here. Uh, yeah, so it's right, the second row right in the middle. Um, right here. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So let me just take a peek here at all these different. Um, so you've got a bunch of downloadable forms here on your your site that look really look really good. But we'll take a peek at the um, um, family caregiver agreement here. And uh, while that's loading up, I'm going to cut and paste this link into chat, and so everybody's got it. Um, and then let's see where we're at here. Okay, Amy Miller, continue. All right. So, um, oh, okay. So this is a uh, this is a nice template that can be modified, um, and uh, and you can. It looks like you can download this, and it gives you all these different categories, transportation, professional appointments, doctor and dentist appointments, grocery store. I, I, I like this. I mean, the, the thing that we all struggle with and that we talk so much about on our discussions is that so many of us are thrown into this circus through a crisis situation. And any kind of tool that we can use that's going to help us think in advance and communicate in advance with those around us can minimize the chances that we're either going to be all by ourselves at the hospital one day with nobody to pick us up, or um, that our our only daughter is in California jumping on a plane to, to drive us home from the hospital um, because it was an unexpected, uh, you know, accident or injury. Um, right. Yeah. And so that's where the idea of having having this done ahead of time, having, again, that concept of an aging concierge being there to help get this filled out. My dream, you know, because this is all being built, uh, is to have them be local. So as you mentioned, that idea of the daughter having to fly in from California, there's a period of time. And I mean, I think AARP did a study once that said 40 percent of um families have one family member that is beyond five hours driving time away five hours is a long time when you're in crisis so who could be on site local you know there within 30 minutes to kind of be that stand-in until your loved ones can arrive it, that's something i don't think people go huh yeah, yeah. who could that be and, and so and while you're hiring it out, I mean, as an aging concierge, but then that person's also that resource to your loved ones because they haven't been around for the day-to-day, -day, you know, you're, oh, you, you have a new medication. I didn't know that. Or, um, you know, I didn't realize that your decline was so significant. Yeah. And, but the, the, your point being is, is that if you don't go through an exercise like this, um, you're not going to identify any of those people anyways. And, and, and then you're not going to be able to have a conversation with them and having something in writing. Uh, <coughs> it, at least it's a, it's a starting point and it clarifies, you know, what, what you're envisioning in your head, you, the, the family member or the, the individual, uh, what, what course of action you'd like to see happen. Now, right. Uh, this kind of ties in with another thing that I know that you're pa passionate about and we can never talk about it enough. And that's advanced, uh, advanced directives. Um, because it seems to me like if uh, either, or if you're going through the trouble of creating an advanced directive, you might as well just pull this piece of paper out and finish this sheet. Because again, a lot of us have advanced directive, but we don't talk to the people who about what's on there. Um, is that, do you see this working hand in hand? So my, usually my first conversation is who can speak for you if you can't speak for yourself? That's usually what, that's the very first question I will oftentimes ask. Uh, and then also who's your executor? People tend to like disappear after the funeral and not to go into that direction, but we all go, we're all gonna be there. Who's the executor and how do they close out your estate? So that actually, they're actually the people I'm doing my whole program for, believe it or not, uh, is the executor. 
because all the documents that you, that you need to gather are all part of this conversation. And the idea is how can we preserve your wealth so you have something to pass on? Because right now, call me a conspiracy theorist if you want, but I think right now there is a concerted effort to have people not have anything left when they pass away. Hmm. Yep. I, that's a pretty audacious no, that's statement. That's great. No, I like when you throw things out there, but let's let's dive into that one a little bit deeper. The um and and uh and and I'll go downstairs and get some tinfoil. No, no, I'm, <laughs> no. That's I I don't think that that's as audacious as you think it is. But but let me kind of hear your explanation on um on that on why. Well, and it leads to housing. So okay. cost of housing. Um, at the end of life, I am, well, let's just put it this way. Again, I'm speaking from my experience here in Minnesota. It's different all around the country, but Minnesota was probably one of the last states to have housing and care be together for our elder community. And in 2019, we passed a law for elder abuse prevention, which, you know, was excellent law. But as a result, we separated our housing and our care. So that's probably reflective, I think, of a lot of other states, is that um, room and board is one price, your Medicare, Medicare, is, Medicare, Medicaid is another. And many people are surprised to realize that, oh, wait, housing is a different, that's not covered. That's a different fee. And I've seen in the last three years, well, first, I should back it up a little bit. We had about 8,000 communities in the state of Minnesota in 2019 when this law was passed. In 2021, when it had to be implemented because all the facilities needed to be licensed, and many of them were just not big enough. They're like, you know, maybe four beds, 10 beds. They're smaller communities. A lot of them closed. Or they turned themselves into 55 plus. So the independent living disappeared. It was only the big, large corporate facilities that remained open. So this was before COVID and before the staffing and all of that. I mean, it, it was actually kind of coincided. So whether it's separate or together, the point is uh, we had about 4,000 beds or facilities, not beds, facilities. And then now with the, with the, um, the staffing challenges, the costs have skyrocketed. So now, I mean, I have a, a, a screen that is on that resources page that says housing options. And that was written a couple of years ago saying, oh yeah, it's about $6,000 for assisted living. Um, you know, memory care would be like 13,000. Well, now in Minnesota, I'm hearing of some clients who are paying 3,000 a week or 12,000 just for assisted living. There is no more independent care because that all became 55 plus and you had to go find your own caregiver. So all of a sudden that, that cost has gone sky high and people are shocked because life savings are gone just in a few months now. That's what I mean. It's almost, I mean, I call it, it's a concerted effort to like reduce your money, but that might be a little, like I said, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but maybe it's truer than we realize. Now, the other uh, reality that I learned about, it's not the case here in Minnesota, but in 30 states around the country, they have filial responsibility laws, which means adult children are responsible for paying for their parents' debts. Huh. So depending on where you are in the country, that's an interesting thing to realize that um, your parents have credit card debt. It doesn't get wiped off at and, and, death. And how, how, what did you call that? It's called a filial responsibility law. And there's 30 states around the country that have that. Okay, great. I, I'll, I'll share a link on that. Um, here we go. Well, I got a, a Wikipedia. Wikipedia is pretty good in terms of not having a bias in, um, uh, in, in something. And so to familiarize yourself with that. Yeah, so meaning that if mom and dad had um, an estate uh, of $100,000 and $110,000 in, in debt, you know, that the family might be responsible for those $10,000. Uh, 
obviously if mom's got $40,000 in credit card debt and a hundred thousand dollars estate, you know, her estate pays for it. And then the kids and probate uh, split the rest. Um, exactly. That's yeah. really good. Um, let me go back to our early, let, let's stick a pin in this conversation. I think it's a great <laughs> one, but uh, Peru <laughs> says family members paying for caregiving family members. It sounds like a great idea. Any details available for how to implement something like this? So it's, something that's allowed by every state. Um, I think there's some states that have like some general guidelines. So I think it was AARP again. I get to do a lot of research. It's been great. Uh, but each state, it, ultimately, if you're paying it yourself and you're not using insurance, you're not using Medicare, it's just yourself. It's just like you paying your dog walker. You know, it's just a personal agreement. And it's, I think, it's supposed to be uh, market rates. Not like you're not trying to like pass off a thousand dollars to go walk the dog, going to that example. Um, and again, if you notice back to my template, and I needed to share this, it looks like a legal document. It I'm not an attorney, so it's not a legal document, it's just a template. I would recommend that if you like, you could share that with your attorney to make sure that it's proper and complete. I did, you want to create it, I did it with guidance from an attorney, just because we wanted to have something that would look like a document that could easily be submitted as a legal document or as a, but it, again, it's an agreement. And this is one of my mediator terms, mediator versus a contract. An agreement is between you and that person. It's kind of a handshake deal. Uh, but it's not necessarily a, you know, fast and hard going, okay, you didn't do this. I'm going to sue you now. That's not the intent. It's to, it's really to be an agreement, um, yeah, so, total handshake deal. Yeah. So like as a mediator, I, I imagine, you know, that you have conversations with your clients who are having a dispute or something of that nature. And then, once you come to the resolution, you create a, an agreement just so both parties see in writing what the expectation is, but this is not a, that would not be a legal agreement either. It, it's No, a it'll be, it would be honored in the courts. Oh, it would, would be. okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. If it's a mediated agreement, both parties come to it free will, and this is what you agreed to, and, you know, that that's there. But it's because both parties came to the to it amongst themselves. Okay. Uh, so and that's where mediation does come from, kind of like the legal industry. Okay. But I'm not doing it as in I'm providing guidance. I'm filling it out. I don't tell you what to charge. I just kind of say, okay, here's a template of some things to consider, and maybe that it doesn't apply to you today. So you leave, let's say, transportation off because you know you can still drive. Um, so it's not something that would be of concern. It's it's that type of a, of a document. But then if let's say someone says, why are you paying someone X amount? Maybe it's like the mystery child that always shows up six months late. Yep. Why? What is this for? Why are you doing this? Um, you're taking mom's money. Uh, no. no. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I could see that that's probably the one of the main reasons to do something like this i think the it, it, with all the conversations that i have individually and on these discussions uh, a great scenario where this is important is i, I like your term mama bear but uh, the mama bear or papa bear which we're going to call the adult child who is lives closest to mom or dad who's sort of been doing all of this work and so many times the conversations with those folks are, yeah, I'm here and I'm doing all the work. My brother and sister support what I'm doing. They're they're over here. If that adult child just had something in writing to to document that, and then also if you know, just think about it. It's like the parent. If I thought about this with my own kids in the future, if I want my my children to be fairly compensated if they're doing something for me. You know, I've I've uh, paid them for helping around the house, and this is just a different way of helping. And um, and it might not be something that I pay to them now. Perhaps it's something 
that I pay to them in the future where, you know, keep track of your hours and here's an hourly rate. And when I pass away, if there's any money left, make sure that you get a little bit extra, you know? Yeah. Um, talk to an attorney before you do that. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm just brainstorming your audacious <laughs> but, idea. Here. But you could say, you could say that there's an insurance policy or something along that yeah, line. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm no. just, I'm just putting that out there. I'm just, <laughs> well, no, I, I can't I, advise I, on that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I get that. And, and I think our audience, again, Folks, you, you're just eavesdropping in on a brainstorming session right now of ideas, but these all make sense because um, affordability, the needs of solo agers, the, the, the caregiver burnout, loneliness and isolation. I mean, like this caregiver agreement. Yeah, so you want to age in place, but, you know, do you want to be lonely and isolated in your home? Is, is that thinking about if there's a reason why it's going to be difficult for you to get out of your home, thinking about who you would want to be surrounded with. And it's okay if you compensate those people to come and play games with you or keep you company, because we know that isolation is a healthcare concern now. Mm -hmm. Or even, like I said, back to the Boy Scout, like, you know, having the Boy Scout take your dad for a walk. So they can share army stories. I mean, there is nothing better than that. No, uh, the the intergenerational connections, and I always tell folks is is that there's a lot of resources right out on our neighborhood street that we're not tapping into. There's a lot of people driving by your house, going to volunteer at the hospital ten miles away, and if they only knew that you needed help or you knew they needed help. Um, we can bring things together, but adding the component that somebody could actually budget to compensate somebody um, the same way that you would hire the daily money manager or the home care agency. I, I like that. I like that approach. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I don't see the uh, the that this is audacious at all, or I don't see the pushback, but obviously You've brought this topic up to people and you've not sort of received 100%, you know, hey, great, Amy, you're governor of Minnesota now. Um, what, what is, uh, what is, what That'd is the improvement? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. What, what are, what are some of the, the, what's some of the pushback that you get when you introduce this topic to folks? It's. Well, one, it's the adult children. I know I'm supposed to do that for free. I wouldn't, I would yeah. never take money from my parents. The mm -hmm. other one is, I mean, I can't even get people to sit down with me to talk about this. I'll be, I'll be straight up. Oh, you want at, at the age that I want. Right. Um, typically it's mom's in the hospital and I, I want her to come home. She wants to come home. I want to take care of her. What do we put together? And it's almost where, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. If you're, let's say you need to, you want to be the, your mom and dad's caregiver. Something we don't have is we don't have a, at least I haven't found one, a training program for family members to be PCAs. That's an opportunity that is massive. Um, so could we train? So and again, that's something that needs to be done in advance. Like you can't learn CPR in the moment. You have to learn CPR beforehand. Uh, now, granted, that's how we parent our children. We don't have classes on, you know, how to do things necessarily before children arrive. But that's how we're looking at our parents is, well, we'll do it when things after things happen. Again, that's where and if people are going to doctor appointments alone, back to that original problem that was placed in front of me. If the person who is in that doctor appointment doesn't know to ask the questions that they need to ask to know what help they need to have because they're in there by themselves, they it's a it's a non conversation starter right from the get go. Um, and you know, and we that's something else we know is that people do not want to be a burden. Period. They don't want to burden anybody. Well, unfortunately. We need people around us as we get older. We cannot do it alone. And that, how to overcome that belief um, is really hard. It's really hard. Unless it's 
been given permission ahead of time. Yeah. And, and I, you know, one of the reasons that this is such a difficult conversation is because it really requires somebody to let go of their ageist viewpoints, their, their viewpoints on independence versus interdependence. Um, the hardest people to do to get to do something for them to do a kind act are the people that are always out there helping other people like it's um uh the 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 folks that are out there volunteering for five different organizations y y you know if you say that you'd like to do something nice for them it's sort of like oh no 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 i just do this because but uh somebody told me once that the the ability to receive help from other people is one of the best experiences to be a better caregiver and um and it's tough to think about um letting go and that these things that you've done for 40 years for yourself you know got to have somebody else do those but it's important um and uh we got to figure out how to how to make those conversations happen. It's there's there's got to be some lead ins to those conversations. Uh, and it's not going to be easy. Right. And that's so that's where with the housing conversation, which is like I said, that's the second largest or maybe it's the most. The biggest expense because we have Medicare to help cover costs if you're over the age of 65. But if you're mm -hmm. let's say you're in that in between 55 to 65, a lot of healthcare issues happen there. And that's where people think, okay, I saved enough, I saved enough. And all of a sudden, boom, there's a healthcare crisis. And that bill comes due and it's it's a big bill typically. Uh, yeah. What happens then? So it's not always just end of life. It could just be you have a healthcare crisis and you need to get yourself back up on your feet and you need someone just to walk with you through that period of time while you're recuperating and you know, one of the saddest stories I hear is when, especially for single men, typically it's single men who will have a healthcare crisis. They're released from the hospital. They go home alone. They have no one to make meals for them, no one to get their medication, no one to do anything. And they're just sitting in their home, just sitting in their home waiting to get something because they don't have those relationships created in advance. So you know, especially for those, the ones who are aging alone, especially men, they don't have the network already created ahead of time. So that's why it's even more important to think about this. Who could be that one person, at least one person you can reach out to and say, do you know a number to call for DoorDash? I mean, something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. A lot of the, there's a, there's a whole group of people that are just kind of suffering alone and and they're in that middle, whether it's like I said, initially it's financial, but I think it's even age, you know, they're not in the 65 plus group. They're in that I'm getting ready to retire mm -hmm. space. Yeah. yeah. And, and none of us have a crystal ball and, you know, we all have friends that have been healthy one day, regardless of their age. And then suddenly, you know, something happens and it changes, but just have conversations you know, getting to the uh, the expensive nature of housing in general, whether it have a sign on the outside that says senior living or not, depending on where you live in the country, um, it can be very difficult. And, and a lot of folks without income just paying their real estate tax in the area that they have if they own their home can be challenging without a job or um, additional income. But uh one of the the solutions that I've been a big fan of and that a lot of folks are talking more about now is home sharing uh, is, and you're sort of, uh, there's a parallel here in that if you're going to share your home, you got to have an agreement with your partner who's going to be sharing the home with you. And I would even suggest oversight. And again, that's back to the AG concierge. And that leads me to audacious idea number two. Oh, great, great. <laughs> so it, it is a co-sharing, especially with, let's say, a young family. Well, what if it was, 
it, and I get this idea, I'm going to back up. I get this idea from a book called Skip, which is Skills to Inherit. And it was, the, it was written for farmers. So how do farmers find people to work the land so they don't have to sell a property to developers? But what if in the urban environment, it was designed to pass fam you know, family home from one family to another? So it's called skills to inherit. So it'd be basically payment or transfer on death. But the idea of that family is giving you that caregiving. They're raising their kids in a great safe and, um, neighborhood. The neighborhoods are staying um, family oriented. And could that be a way that would kind of be the carrot and the stick sort of concept that for a family, they could be like, I could inherit this home. But again, that this is where the audacious idea kicks in because most seniors will go, I don't know about that. <laughs> They're gonna off me right off the bat, right? Um, so that's why I'm saying to do that, I think there should be oversight. Not to get into your business, but to make sure that there are protections in place. Yeah, and the, yeah, and 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 again, I mean, I I like that idea, and it kind of, um, I believe my my uh, grandmother-in-law basically she didn't the family didn't move into her home, but she built a an using her funds built an uh, attached wing on my wife's uh, family home, which ultimately when they sold that home, it was a transfer of, of wealth there in exchange for um, being there. So I think there's a lot of creative, there's a lot of creative ways out there, but I think having somebody like you to sort of brainstorm these ideas with, with folks, there's no one way for for anyone, but I think the thing that I'm getting through our conversation today is really that we need to document it somehow. And and this caregiving agreement is a great first start. Well, healthcare directives is a good place to well, start. Healthcare, caregiving agreement that yeah. comes next. <laughs> but I, yeah, and I, yeah, the healthcare directives is great, but I, yeah. I I see a lot of healthcare directives that are filled out and nobody knows where they are. And the, and nobody who needs to know where they are. That's why there's that initiative to have them on your refrigerator, you know, and uh, things like that. Because we're showing up at the emergency room and well, does she have an advanced medical directive? And nobody knows, you know? So, well, yeah. The one nice thing is in the state of Minnesota, on the back of our driver's license, you can click... Yes, I have one. And it'll be written right on your driver's license. Huh. Okay. So I don't then, know if that's done in other states or not. Yeah. But now where would, is there, uh, is there a Minnesota repository where those documents are? It should be with your doctor. Should be okay. on, your doctor should have that on file. <laughs> um, but the idea also is it causes people to go, oh, okay, let's ask that question instead of just automatically assuming. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and I think that if we have more check boxes like that, like when we're getting our driver's license renewed, um, when you're going to the doctor for a physical, uh, regardless of your age, uh, hey, mom and dad, you ever think about advanced medical directives? You know, hey, teenager like at 18, have you ever thought of a healthcare oh, directive? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it starts, it starts younger than we think. And that's, that's the point of my, what I'm trying to do. This is a conversation for the adult children to make sure their teens have that before they head off to college. Wow. Okay. Now I just glanced at the clock and we're almost to the top of the hour. So now let me reference those uh, books that you've got behind you. The first one is your um, Last Life Lessons workbook. Is that, tell us what's in that. Is, is it a lot of what we're talking about? Yes. I mean, it's, it's 30,000 foot. What do you need to know? Um, what do you need to do at the end of every chapter is the checklist of the documents you need to collect. This book is truly designed for your executor. Again, people, the executor is always like at the, is an afterthought. So if you could have all the documents put together and one thing I'm not sharing, but I will throw up here real quick. 
it's a book like this or a folder like this or a box or something where you put all those documents and you just let them know where that's located. One of the things I've, again, I've heard, clients have shared, uh, when someone passes away, how many people immediately go to the home and go take whatever they want? And the executor's like, I just learned I'm the executor and it's like maybe a day or two later and things that they needed to have are now gone. Um, so it's it's a way for you to be organized and getting your those documents to let your executor know where they are so they can go in, secure your home as quickly as possible uh, and reduce costs down the road because everything's already there. It's already organized. Um, each topic, I do the, like what I call the four-legged stool, which is the legal, financial, health care, and funeral planning. There's socialization, there's housing, there's uh, your legacy as well. What conversations or what things do you need to do as a veteran? What do you need to do as a solo? Uh, there's a chapter I need to put in there, which is when I rewrite my book. Um, will be if you're an immigrant, what do you need to know? Mm -hmm. Because they have a separate, they have a different set of guidelines they have to follow. And then I have part two, which is where I go into the caregiving agreement. And then I have another audacious idea, but um, that's turning yourself into an LLC. But that's a whole nother ball game. <laughs> yeah, no, that sounds yeah. like a workshop. Uh, that would be great. To, something to run once you get that group of people that are are doing that. Now, the other yeah. book behind you is the Aging in Place Conversations, which I'm dropping into chat. Um, and we featured that uh, when it came, first came out. And that is each chapter is written by a different expert. And re refresh my memory, what was what's your chapter on in that book? So it's a partnership with National Aging in Place Council. And they brought together 20 authors from around the country on all on basically the same pillars and they call it pillars. I call it chapters. Uh, and each of us were asked questions on how would we respond to some of those conversations you want to have with your loved ones? What resources do you have? So they have like lots of QR codes that give you access to great information. Uh, I mean, it's a really, it's a wonderful resource book. It's something that is, uh, put together by the National Aging in Place Council. Uh, and just a, a basically you're learning from the best of the best from around the country. And um, so whether you're living in one state, maybe move to another, getting maybe access to some of that information you need in that other state, or let's say your vacation a few months uh, away from your normal home, what mm -hmm. do you need to know? Um, or what some resources that you could tap into? So it's a, it's a great complimentary book that for any aging conversation you might have, it's a great book to um, add to your library. I love it. And then your company name is Our Family Encounter. What are, what is the, um, what services do you offer if somebody is in our audience? Like just how, why would somebody call you up and what can you offer them? My first is to get the plan put in place. So it's getting this documentation done. This, the, so it's whether you wanna do it yourself, you wanna do it with assistance. Okay. The second level is in, it actually implementing or putting together the aging plan, whatever, you know, whether it's the caregiving agreement or that LLC concept, um, which is another audacious idea. And then the third one is what I call implementing it, which means you have an aging concierge in place. And that's when you're going through that process, who can walk with you. And I said, that one's in development still. Okay. Uh, but the idea is you're not doing this stuff alone. You have someone walking with you through this whole process. I love it. Um, Amy, this has been an awesome discussion. You've thrown out some great ideas and, and I can see from the comments that Folks, there are things that people didn't think about and um, real excited to stay in touch and let us know, you know, as things change and as you, um, you know, expand these ideas, I, I think they're wonderful and they're so needed because uh, we have more older adults than we've ever had in the history of this country 
we've got more affluent older adults, we've got more impoverished older adults, and we've got more caught between the cracks older adults. And we've got to yeah. find solutions for all three of those groups. I just noticed a, a note from Elizabeth saying uh, great ideas that are workable. So that's wonderful feedback for me that, okay, I'm not being yeah. so audacious that I'm like. I, I really don't think you are. I think that you're, the way that you've described this and the way that your approach is that it's just getting people to think about this a little bit differently. And, and, and something that I find that is very much um, is to take things out of the arena that we're dealing with, with what you're talking about. We, we don't want to infantilize elders. It's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to, we also don't want to become parents to our parents. That's not a good thing either. However, if you look back in the days, if you raised kids, especially if you've got a few years between uh, kids, legitimately, I got paid as a babysitter to watch my brother, who's eight years younger than me. And that's, you know, that's fair. I, I mean, uh, we want to compensate people. And I, I like that you've thrown that out there. Um, so, uh, oh, <laughs> this is really good. Helen, thank you. What is an LLC? An LLC is a limited liability corporation. And uh, Amy, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Turn yourself into one. Yeah. So, so the the value of an LLC is is that literally, if you if you know what you're doing, and when I say if you know what you're doing, if you know how to navigate Google, you can literally open up an LLC and have a corporation that protects you administering um, some of these, these costs and services there. And uh, so that's what an LLC, it enables an individual to quickly create a corporation that might pay for services uh, like companionship, transportation, you name it. Right. Um, so yeah, typically people see that as a personal care assistant, they would open themselves up an LLC. But I'm actually suggesting a senior, especially if they have more substantial, so let's say have 500,000 plus to 2 million, it's kind of tapping into what a private liability corporation is, which is what the ultra wealthy use to transfer assets from one generation to the next. So it's tapping onto the other end of the spectrum and bringing it down to those who could afford to self-fund basically a company. Yep. All yep. right. Well, this is great. Um, everybody, have, it's it's Wednesday. I guess that's hump day. They used to call it that. But uh, have a great rest of the week. And we will see you all soon. And just remember that, um, oh, let's hear. I, I, I always like Carla Anderson here. She says, as a long-term RN independent caregiver, I fully agree with all the concepts Amy shared. I work to remain health sovereign. I, I like that term, uh, uh, Carla, and teach others how to become so. I assist seniors at home, which almost always includes helping family members understand about care provided. So uh, uh, this, that's a great endorsement from Carla. I, I know firsthand uh, some families that she's helped. And uh, this, this is a great audacious discussion. But in this circle, nobody thinks it's audacious. It's all the people that didn't tune in today. <laughs> Share, share, have them share. <laughs> exactly. That's why we record these things, folks. So thanks a lot, Amy. And we'll be seeing y'all soon.